You are listening to the Cookbook Love Podcast with Maggie Green, episode number 302. Welcome to the Cookbook Love Podcast, a podcast that celebrates cookbook readers, buyers, collectors, writers, and clubs. And now your host, cookbook author, culinary dietitian, and cookbook writing coach, Maggie Green. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Cookbook Love Podcast. Happy first day of summer. Here in Kentucky, we are having the most beautiful weather. This particular week has been uh, bright blue skies, actually low humidity, really comfortable temperatures for leaving the windows open at night. And one of my favorite things to do this time of year is we have screen door that goes out to our patio. And then in the front door, I replace the full view glass with a screen and I can open both doors and get this nice cross breeze in the house. And my favorite thing to do then is have that open while I'm doing some cooking, listening to the radio, putting away some groceries. When I can leave those doors open all day, it is like heaven. And it's just been so beautiful, really enjoying the weather, taking lots of walks and um, doing my work. I've had a busy week here in my cookbook office this week with private coaching, wrapping up cookbooks on KDP, interviewing three really amazing cookbook writers. Uh, It's just been a really uh, fun week. And tonight, our son is actually coming home for a couple nights. He's going to be spending the night here. Um, We're going to a wedding this weekend. And then on Sunday, we're going to head down to see our daughter and go to equestrian event with her for Father's Day. So, A lot of fun things coming up, and um, it's great to be here and so excited about the interview that we have today with Phoebe Lapine. Phoebe is a food and health writer, chef, speaker, and the voice behind the award-winning blog, Feed Me Phoebe. She's the author of four books, including her recently published book, Carbivore, a cookbook with 130 recipes to help readers stop fearing carbs and embrace the comfort foods they love. During our interview, Phoebe and I talk about her journey as a cookbook writer, how being diagnosed with an autoimmune disease shifted her food perspective and her work as a food writer, the role of SEO in naming her cookbooks, as well as Phoebe's tips for balancing her processes for blogging, social media, book marketing, all while writing another book. So without further delay, let's dive into this interview with Phoebe Lapine. Hi, Phoebe. Welcome to the Cookbook Love Podcast. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm so excited that you're here. As always, love to talk to food writers, cookbook authors about their new books. But before we dive in, why don't you tell everybody a little bit about who you are and what you do? Absolutely. So I say that I've been a food woman of many trades. Um private chefing, catering. Um, But really, I got my start in blogging back back in the dark ages of blogging in 2008. I had a site that I started kind of on the side of my corporate job for fellow 20-somethings cooking first meals and first apartment kitchens with limited money and skill and time and space, obviously. And that website ended up, you know, getting a book deal pretty early on, which was really lucky. And that allowed me to kind of quit my day job and to again, become um, a keeper of odd food jobs (laughs) in New York City. And on the eve of that cookbook coming out, I actually got diagnosed with an autoimmune disease and had to kind of drastically change my diet in order to treat it. And one of the big things I did was go gluten-free And that was, you know, 13 years ago before there were really any cookbooks about it, really any products on the shelf. And that kind of led to, you know, the second coming of my food career and trying to figure out how to do all of these things as someone with dietary restrictions. As it was at the time, I was, you know, going out to publicize my first cookbook, which was such a dream, and I couldn't eat any of the recipes in it anymore. Not not all of them, but like 50%. And so I was like making all these chocolate chip cookies for the book parties and not even being able to lick the spatula. So I went through many stages of grief with that, but then I kind of embraced, you know, my restrictions and ended up 
dealing with more of them, um, which I write about in my second and third books. Um, the second book was called The Wellness Project, kind of about my autoimmune journey. And the third book is a book called SIBO Made Simple, which is an IBS <laughs> opus um, and a recipe book for the low FODMAP diet, which, you know, is ultra restrictive. I thought gluten free was bad, but um, low FODMAP is is also dairy free or limited dairy and takes out a lot of really healthy vegetables too. Um, but at the end of the day, I've really found um, kind of a real calling to help people who you know not by choice have to take on these restrictions and helping yeah. people still find joy in them, still find deliciousness. And, you know, I think it's also the unfortunate thing is when you start to have dietary restrictions, it means that you can't just go to your same store-bought shortcuts. You can't have the same takeout foods, just your, your options are more limited and it kind of brings you to your kitchen, which is, you know, can be a blessing, but I know for a lot of people just starting out who maybe didn't even cook before, you know, it can be a really stressful thing. So I'm always trying to help people along with that. And my latest book is called Carbivore. And I decided to write it after I really found that people had become so fearful of carbs in the era of keto and, um, autoimmune paleo and all these kind of therapeutic diets that have become kind of zealot lifestyles. <laughs> and so I really wanted to address for people who love food as much as I do, um, how to keep carbs on the table without them causing any adverse effects. And um, the first part of the book kind of discusses that. And then the second part of the book, if, if you don't even care about any of that, is just really healthy, wholesome, delicious carb forward recipes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, why don't we talk about um, your journey as a food writer and what this meant for you to be having to face these restrictions and how you incorporated these restrictions into the work that you did and how you turned it into a calling rather than um, something that you were a victim of. I think that that's a fascinating way to look at it because as you know, food, we think we're food writers, oh, we can just write about anything and we can talk about anything. We can go anywhere to eat and um, for you, that wasn't necessarily the case. So what was it that led you to start to see that this really was a calling for you? Um, well, I always knew it was a calling. And I think it was. It took me a little while to really find my niche, um, like in the autoimmune community, in um, among some of these other specialty diets. I mean, I really tried to soldier on for, for many years in there, developing recipes for food and wine and um, kind of just hiding the fact that I had, oh. that I was gluten-free and had these restrictions in the first place. And so I would test recipes that I was comfortable comfortable with and I knew that weren't gluten-free. I'd have like taste testers and I would just kind of like play it a little fast and loose and like taste things sometimes. And same thing with, with clients, you know, private chefing, catering, you know, when you're working for a client, you don't get to choose what you make. And so um, I had to just be um, on top of my skill set, you know, with pasta, I can tell when pasta's done just by, you know, cutting into it or by not even ingesting the bite, by taking a bite and just feeling the texture um, and various other things. I don't know. I just had to rely on my my limited um, experience, and it was limited because I was still in my 20s, um, of cooking prior to dietary restrictions to get me through. But yeah, it took until, you know, I really had to completely revamp my health and and take on a bunch of these other um kind of wellness oriented practices um which i write about in my second book that i kind of ended up owning the narrative and shifting kind of the point of view on my website and i was really amazed by you know the people who were already following me already part of my audience who were dealing with thyroid issues, with autoimmune issues, with autoimmune thyroid issues like Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is what I was diagnosed with. And so even though I, I wouldn't say that I necessarily alienated people who weren't gluten-free or who, you know, were omnivores and followed me for just, you know, doable recipes, but I think it just created much more of a bond, at least with the subset of my audience who, you know, felt like they weren't being included in more mainstream food conversations um, and who still wanted, you know, their food to taste delicious. I think, you know, sometimes 
dietitians and nutritionists and if you're lucky enough to have a, a medical practitioner, a doctor who gives you recipes or any sort of toolkit to help you through a diagnosis, um, on the flavor front, on the joy front, you know, sometimes these recipes can feel a little bit like a mathematical equation and not really harken back to the things that you once loved to eat. And that can be such a difficult thing. I mean, I think where I tried to find the sweet spot in my work and where I still think I kind of am one of the few who kind of touches upon both is that, you know, there's kind of half of the conversation with Western medicine that doesn't really talk about food at all. And then there's the integrative half, the wellness world that says food is medicine. And I'm kind of of the mindset that yes, you know, food is medicine, but it's not just medicine. And for people who merely talk about it as medicine, who merely write recipes from the point of view that food is medicine, we're actually losing a lot. We're losing culture. We're losing, you know, a lot of our pleasure. And I think pleasure is a huge part of our general health. Yeah, I think it is too. And I think, you know, the act of cooking and cooking for and with people and cooking things that you enjoy eating is um, a lot of the joy of it. I know for me personally, and it sounds like it is for you too. What do you mean when you say owning the narrative? And I think this is important for people to think about because sometimes we don't necessarily really think of cookbook authors as always owning the narrative. Aren't they just writing about topic A, then about topic B, then about topic C? But for you, it really became different when you finally did quit, like, I guess, like hiding behind the diagnosis and you like entered into it. And what what shift happened in you and what were you able to accomplish um, other than just like attracting the people that needed to hear what you had to say? How'd that feel as a writer to finally do that? Um, it was a little scary. And I still think to this day, you know, I'm not someone who like food and wine anymore turns to for recipe development yeah. or, you know, I'm never going to have a food network show. That's okay. Like there it's, you know, all of these mass national platforms, um, they don't, you know, drill down as much on special diets. Um, even, you know, my, my new cookbook, which is the, the title carbivore is tongue in cheek. It's not a diet book. Um, it still gets filed a lot of the time and like diet and nutrition, whereas I think it belongs in the general cookbook table because it's just, you know, a beautiful four color cookbook about carbs. Um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I, I I would say like having done this for a long time and um, now being immersed in influencer culture and whatnot, I think there are a lot of people who share their life, share, you know, food content that are not living according to whatever they're sharing. Um, there are a lot of staunch vegans who actually do have a more diverse diet, who do eat some meat or fish or what have you. There are a lot of um, people who make a lot of quote unquote unhealthy type foods or who are omnivores who actually do discover like me that they you know are sensitive to dairy or sensitive to gluten and kind of eat very differently behind the scenes. Um, I think I just always felt like my authenticity and my vulnerability um, in my writing, even when it was just about cooking in a small kitchen, <laughs> was, um, you know, what set my work apart and what got me my first book deal and what kind of helped me build an audience. So I just always wanted to be true to that yeah. and to, yeah, never, never purport an image that was different than, you know, what was happening. And I think with life. brand offers too these days, like brands maybe wanting to partner with people and, you know, offering money for that, it's tempting to like step away from who you really are in essence of like working with the brand. But for recipe development, for me, I was always like, I would be willing to do it for a brand if it, that I believed in and something that I would yeah. incorporate into my own life. And that I've was I've lost a lot of money along the way <laughs> having to be gluten free and just like. I don't know, just being really picky. like Yeah, being... well, and I think that that's, there's, I don't know. I just always wanted to lay my head on the pillow at night and know that it was like, yeah. this is true to who I am. If someone yeah. eats a recipe that I developed with a certain brand, it's because they could come into my house and see that particular brand. Like totally. In my refrigerator or freezer or on my counter, and it would be something that I uh, lined with. But, you know, sometimes owning the narrative and narrowing it down and really being true to who we are, it probably at the base level though, broadened up the market for you in terms of people that like 
saw what you were doing and could relate to what you were doing through this narrowing of what you were willing to do. Yeah. And, yeah. And I think that um, I'm going to talk about carbs, though, because this is a word that everyone hears. And mm -hmm. um, it's a macronutrient. It's one of the big three protein, mm -hmm. carbs and fats. But let's talk about the new book and why you decided to call it Carbivore and what the book is about, because I think that um, this is an opportunity for people who are listening to um, think about this macronutrient in a different way. And um, I love what you've done and I can't wait for you to tell everybody all about it. Yeah. So honestly, the idea actually came about during the pandemic because I felt like it was a time where, you know, be out of necessity because they're affordable and pantry friendly, that people were eating more carbs than ever. And, you know, while there was like definitely, you know, a narrative and diet culture about, you know, what was happening, um, to people's, you know, wellness picture during that time, I actually think a lot of people kind of became a little bit more like came to terms with carbs. You know, people were making their own bread. They were kind of discovering that, you know, there's a whole spectrum to the conversation of low carb and carbophobia in general. And hello, you know, civilizations have lived on bread and pasta and rice and whole grains for centuries, you know, in and of themselves those items aren't evil. Um, there's a lot that's changed with, you know, how um, big food produces. Bread and pasta are, are two examples that I come back to again and again, and how we cook them, how we ingest them, how we live our life around our meals that have changed. And so I just really want to dig in for people um, and look into, you know, kind of the good, the bad, and the healthy when it came to carbs. Um, I kind of always go a little bit too far in the front matter of my book. So there's like 50 pages of like scientific information for those who want it. Um, but then, you know, based on just people embracing, you know, kind of a carb inclusive balanced meal during the pandemic, I was like, I want to write a healthy carb cookbook. I want to write it by type of carbs. You can shop your pantry. So the book is organized by, uh, we'll see if I can rattle off all the categories, all the chapters that oats, rice, whole grains from around the world, which includes quinoa, millet, and buckwheat, um, then noodles, potatoes, bread, corn, legumes. I feel like I'm missing one, but um. <laughs> I think that and the, the top one was um, carb companions, sauces, condiments. Oh yeah, so, starters. So those but are, all, you hit all of them. Yep. Yes, those are. That's just the yeah. the non-carb chapter to help right. you along. But yeah, and so each of the chapters kind of has a mix of what you would find in a traditional cookbook: a mix of you know soups, salads, mains, breakfast, desserts, and yeah, I think it's just a really fun way to experiment with you know, different carbs that you kind of tend to always have on hand mm -hmm. and to find healthy ways to use them. Yeah. And so let's talk about carbs even a little bit more than that. What do you wish that people knew about carbs or what do you hope that this book might change in the minds of the people who are um, using the book or listening when it comes to carbs? Yeah. So, I mean, carbs in and of itself is kind of a slang term. As you mentioned, carbohydrates are a macronutrient that truly include all plants on earth. So, you know, I know there are people who do have a carnivore diet. I mean, I won't, I won't hate on it on, in today's conversation, but I would argue if you did eliminate all carbohydrates, I don't think it would be beneficial for your long term. <laughs> vitality. Um, so it, that would include so many incredible vegetables, such diversity of nutrients. And I think since my first book was about gut health, you know, if there's just one rule of thumb to live by, you know, to be quote unquote healthy, I think it's always diversity on the plate, diversity in your diet, diversity of plants. And when we reduce carbs, I think that that diversity kind of goes with it. So um, that's kind of the mindset of the book. And I think one thing that I would love people to take away is that it's not necessarily always what you're eating, but how you're eating it. And people, I think, find such comfort in omission in our culture. And I don't know why it would be easier for someone to eliminate all carbs than to maybe change <laughs> 
a few aspects of your habits, um, your sleep, your stress. It sounds wishy-washy, but I promise you the data is there that these things actually are super impactful when it comes to your blood sugar. So the book just tries to lay out that there are, you know, a million a million ins if you mm-hmm. are concerned about your blood sugar, if you are concerned about inflammation, and there's a way to keep the foods that you love on your plate while maybe offsetting some of the chaos that they can cause in the body. And I've I found some really interesting fun facts about the way bread is produced today, the way pasta is produced today. And most of the time, it's like if we can just kind of harken back a little bit to what I call the slow carb era, which is really not just about um, you know how fast the carbs reach our bloodstream, but about how we prepare them in our kitchens, about how our pasta is actually made. You know, the slower, the slower, more handmade varieties are actually metabolized more slowly and as they are meant to be in our body. So um, the book contains a lot of a lot of tips like that for how to choose ingredients. And then a lot of most of the recipes I would say are kind of designed around fiber forward vegetables, nuts, seeds, um, as a way to kind of um, slow your carbs roll to your bloodstream. And again, add more nutrients and plant diversity at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love the way you did the chapters. I wondered if we could dive in a little bit to maybe some of the um, topics that you you covered from, you have oats, rice, like you said, the whole grains from around the world, noodles, potatoes, bread, corn, and legumes. And I, I don't know I if there's them. a particular grouping of those that you think like is most, a lot of people are concerned about, or they're one that they automatically eliminate that we ought to talk about, or maybe dispel some myths um, or should I just pick one and we'll dive yeah, in? Yeah, no, I mean, I think bread and pasta okay, let's are talk the about ones that. that are like quintessential slang carbs. Right, um, okay. So by the way, the like pasta... the slang of carbs is, we're talking about starches, yes, <laughs> essentially. <right. laughs> and you talk about the chapter, it's called noodles. So tell us about the chapter and what you would love for everyone to know about noodles. You mentioned something just in the last little bit about the fact that, you know, the slower made, handmade Perhaps pastas are maybe really even digested slower than yeah. uh, we might realize. So um, I think that's a fascinating concept and maybe might open up some avenues for some people in their mind about noodles. Yeah. So noodles, um, if you go into the aisle these days, you'll be hit with a mountain of options. It used to be just like whole wheat versus regular. Now you've got your lentil pasta, your chickpea pasta, your rice noodles, and kind of unlike some of the other carb categories where whole grains really matter, what your noodles are made from when it comes to your blood sugar is just not that impactful at the end of the day. Because at the end of the day, it is flour processed in in an industrial processor, pulverizing the fiber into microscopic bits. Some of it may help your gut health, you know, down the line once it reaches your large intestine, but it is a processed food. And that's not to say like, don't eat pasta because it's a processed food, but it's just something to keep in mind. So I think the conversation gets really skewed around this type of stuff. And one conversation that I've been, you know, privy to um, more so than others over the last decade is, of course, the gluten-free lifestyle, people who are sensitive to gluten but aren't necessarily celiac. It's certainly been majorly on the rise. And there are a lot of people who say, oh, well, I can go to Italy and I can eat pasta and I don't have as much sensitivity to it. I don't have as much trouble digesting it. And there are a couple different prongs to that conversation. You know, some people are like, it's the pesticides. Some people are like, it's, you know, GMO wheat. There actually isn't GMO wheat. (laughs) It's hybridized. Um, But some people are like, oh, well, it's just, there's less gluten naturally in the flour over there. So that's the instinct. And I think it's a really fun myth to dispel because actually most Italian pasta is made from semolina wheat, which is higher in gluten than normal flour. Because again, gluten is a protein and it's really important um, for creating that chewy, amazing texture in our pasta. So 
okay, so we're starting with an ingredient that's actually higher in gluten. Why am I less sensitive to it? And that, again, comes back to how that pasta is prepared a lot of the time. So you'll see on the front of a lot of packages in Italy, and you can find them in your in the grocery store um, here as well, slow dried or lento is the Italian word for it. So what happens is, you know, when we make our pasta, um, back in the day, it used to be laid out in the sun to slowly, you know, dry out. And what happens is that means the protein, the gluten, um, is not going to be reacting to a really, um, kind of harsh change in temperature. And for anyone who cooks, you know what happens when you take a protein straight from the fridge and put it straight in a hot pan, or if you take it straight from the hot pan and put it right you know, on your cutting board and slice into it right away, the protein needs to relax. Um, so the same thing happens when you make pasta in um, an industrial fashion, which uses, you know, which tries to speed up the process of every step of making food as much as possible. And that includes kind of flash drying the pasta. And so what happens is the protein becomes just this really tight knit, uh, I don't know, mesh of sorts. And your body just has a harder time breaking it down. Um, so whether or not, you know, it's a true gluten sensitivity, or it's just that, you know, that particular pasta is harder to digest. It's something to keep in mind. It's not the entire story. I do think there is something to like the pesticide conversation, a lot of these other things, but I think that part is really interesting and kind of speaks to how we don't question enough of the how and yeah. fixate a little bit too much on the what. On no. I can't eat pasta. I can't eat bread instead of, well, how is the pasta you've been eating prepared? Um, how is it made? And then how are you preparing it in your home with what other ingredients? Because in this noodle chapter, there's quite a variety of recipes that contain different types of noodles. And so, um, you know, there's orzo, uh, there's um, sesame noodles. Yeah, uh, I tried to knock out a lot of different shapes exactly. and some rice noodles as well. Right. Some soba noodles. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I think it's it's really um a fun chapter and a lot of really good flavors and um everything, you know, it's just so funny to look at the pictures and you think about the things that people enjoy eating, whether they're going out, but making it at home, I think pasta is really a very approachable thing to make at home. And, oh yeah. It's uh, my lazy go to exactly. weeknight meal. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Let's talk about bread. That's the next <laughs> one. So you have the chapter on bread. Tell us about bread and um, might be the same kind of thing. Like people say, well, if I go to Europe or I go to Paris, I can eat the baguette yeah. at home. I can't do it. But talk about the differences in that. Or is it a similar thing? It is similar. You know, again, it's we've sped up the rise time. We've sped up the developing of the gluten, you know, in industrial mixers. And a lot of times, you know, processed bread will add more, will add more gluten to the mix in that case, um, with an ingredient called vital wheat gluten. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's really, you know, our bread used to be made from sourdough starter, which is a bacterial process that actually reduces the carb count in your loaf, it actually reduces the gluten as well. And is generally a lot easier for people to, to digest um, and lower in carb for those who are, you know, have blood sugar considerations. Um, so not just going to Europe and whatnot, but I think a lot of people, if they try to eat true sourdough from the farmer's market or try to make their own, they have a much easier time again, because that ancient bacterial process is doing some of the digesting already for us. Yeah. I often wondered if it's um, trouble with yeast also that people might have trouble mm -hmm. with more than just um, the gluten itself. It's it's hard to say, but with sourdough, of course, you don't have that. It is just yeah. the natural fermentation of the um, bread. Is there a recipe in the book for sourdough bread? There's not, you know, I didn't really, I'm not the biggest baker in the world. Yeah, so yeah. it's more, you know, how to use your, it's the chapter is called loaves and crusts for yeah. a reason. So it's how to use those loaves, how to yeah. use this crust. There's a lot of breadcrumbs. I have kind of starter recipes at the beginning for different fun types of croutons and flavored breadcrumbs to make. And those are kind of incorporated into a bunch of other recipes in the book, but um, there's a delicious grilled romaine Caesar-ish salad that has Parmesan pangri pangritata breadcrumbs, um, which is funny because pangritata was kind of 
poor man's Parmesan in the old country in Italy, you know, when money was tight, you'd fry up some bread and oil and garlic to sprinkle on your pasta instead of cheese. But to gild the lily, I added the cheese too to the pancreatasa. So yeah. you get both. Yeah. I love the different breadcrumb recipes. You and one had old bay in it. One was just uh -huh. called plain Jane breadcrumbs. And I think it's fascinating, even in restaurants, how much more I've seen breadcrumbs used in recipes, like mm. on a Caesar salad, instead of, you know, big croutons, just these really nicely seasoned yeah, breadcrumbs. Yeah, I love the texture. And I think that buying gluten-free bread or sourdough bread and making breadcrumbs is a really great way to add that crunch and that flavor. Mm. And obviously it's, you know, gluten-free. It's very different than what's in the jar or the yes, can. I feel 100%. like- Breadcrumbs is a real category that needs work at the store, but yes. nothing beats the fresh stuff that you make. And it takes two seconds. It you know, I so store good. my gluten-free bread in the freezer. I toast up a piece. I put it in a food processor. I got crumbs. So but, good. Or you can just freeze your your pre-made dried breadcrumbs. So delicious. So um, something we talked about before we started the show was how you um, created the title for your cookbook mm -hmm. and um, came up with the title Carbivore. And then you related a story to me that one of your previous books, you actually dove into some keyword research to, to name your book. And I wondered if you would talk about this process that we go through as cookbook writers and cookbook authors of what we call our books and um, how you have done that over the course, because you've written four books and how you've done that over the process of writing your books and what the payoff has been in terms of people finding the book, because that's what we always want is people to be able to like discover our book yeah. based on certain words. So tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, it's a real push and pull between your artistic vision and the reality of publishing today, which is that 80% of books are bought on Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, and there's like another piece of the pie that's just bought online. So off of a thumbnail, off of a search term. And I really was not getting with the times um, for my second book, which my publisher really wanted to have Hashimoto's or autoimmune disease in the title or subtitle. And I was just like, no, this is like a, it's a memoir. <laughs> like it's not, it's actually the lessons apply beyond, you know, the people dealing with those conditions. Like it is kind of more of a, a general health book. How do you deal with a diagnosis of any kind? How do you figure out how to do right by your life? Do right by your life um, without, you know, putting your body um, through too much. So um, I won that argument, but once the book came out, I questioned whether or not I had lost. I had lost because I think it would have actually been smarter. Just it's kind of a question about, you know, the integrity of the project and, you know, what seems sexier on the surface. But then if you have fewer people reading it and finding it, I don't know if that really serves you at the end of the day. So my third book, I was had less um, attachment to. I wanted it to be a resource for people who are dealing with SIBO or IBS, newly diagnosed. And so I knew always knew it was going to be a search term book. And so I was fine putting that, you know, front and center in the title. And the result is it's my best selling book. I mean, I don't know. It just continues to sell every single day because of that and to help people. And yeah, again, it's my least sexy book, like the least artistically or creatively fulfilling book. Um, but it's really good. I, I actually like it's full of amazing recipes that I still make. I kind of um add garlic and onion back to them. Low FODMAP diet, that's like yeah. the big omission is garlic yeah. and onion. And yeah. so I'll just like add it to yeah. some of the recipes in that book, but they're all, you know, they're pretty good. And I think, yeah, I've kind of gained a following just from people who come out the other side of that process. Um, and then carnivore was really where I wanted to meet people where they're at on the other side. Um, and I thought the title was so clever. I was really excited about it. Um, we talked about search terms with the publisher and, you know, we're just like, no, this is it. This is exactly describes the book. And then none of us somehow thought that autocorrect was going to correct carbivore to carnivore, mm. literally everywhere. It's impossible. You search, you have to kind of search it on Amazon with my name to find it or oh, to wow. like read the small print when it autocorrects and, 
you know, kind of click on the original title. So it's really frustrating. And yeah, I mean, what's done is done. It's out there. Um, but yeah, it does make you question kind of the value of a search term or single yeah. subject book. Um, so and- if someone is actually someone like you, they they have a health condition, they're writing about the health condition, they're developing recipes around it. It sounds like from the, if we look at your second, third and fourth book, although this one isn't necessarily around it, a health condition, but let's look at books two and three. Mm-hmm. Having SIBO in the title helped that book. Oh yeah. And I wonder, had Hashimoto's been in the second I one, do know. you wonder that? I do all the time. Yes. I know. Well, and so, but, but but I think that that is what, when it feels kind of scary to narrow it down to say SIBO, like, oh yeah. gosh, I'm going to eliminate a lot of people. There's people that maybe would like this book that don't have SIBO that might totally, not buy it because of that. Totally, because it's helpful to anyone with gut issues. 100%. Yeah. Right. Right. But it really brought in the market for the people that had it that really, you know. Yeah. And how does it feel, though, to have a book, though, that is truly helping people like that and isn't necessarily like an artistic vision book? I mean, it feels so meaningful to me. Yeah, I, I yeah. struggle with it, though. You know, I, I was able to find, you know, creativity in the recipe development process. But, you know, it's like I'm not getting like I didn't get any mainstream press yeah. for that book. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it was ahead of its time. I mean, I was really the first to market with like a solid treatment overview slash recipe book. Um, yeah. There were kind of some that dealt with one or the other, but I mean, there's still wasn't even a totally comprehensive treatment oriented book. There are a few now, um, but yeah, it really just kind of I, I don't I don't hit the wave. <laughs> I think that's kind of interesting, yeah, though, because the early that's way where, very often, but this is where the embodiment and your willingness to like say, OK, this is who I am and this is the ground I'm going to stand on. And owning the narrative sacrificed the publicity and like the big splash, perhaps for yeah. helping, truly helping people based on the person that you are and what you've learned from this. Right. And it's a interesting um, balance to uh, walk. And so yeah. if anyone's listening and they're thinking about a health book or they're wondering about it, I do think that you've brought up some interesting points about that. And um, I think it's a little bit of soul searching though. Like what do we really, and what's the real why behind why we're doing this, that particular book? Cause under yeah. your umbrella, obviously carbivore, you were able to like be a little more creative, an artistic vision developing through this book. And um, yeah, it was just a more general, general cookbook. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but you know, I have to say there's so many strategies to getting a book out there. I mean, I didn't get the mainstream publicity, but I didn't need it. The book's exactly. just selling because of search it's terms. because of search terms. <laughs> right, right. Because the publicity is supposed yeah. to be for promoting the book and helping people to discover it. If they're discovering right. it without that. But, you know, a little bit of us, though, likes to get that publicity. Just oh, yeah. For, it's great for our ego. 100%. And- it's yeah. just a little bit more exhausting. I'm working much harder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Shout from the rooftops about this book and be like, and when you search for it, make sure it doesn't autocorrect to carnivore. <laughs> Isn't that something that you're having to say? That's something you never yeah. would have really thought about. No. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about um, you've been a blogger, social media, marketing, writing books um, is a juggling act. You have a lot of balls that are in the air. And I think that um, one thing that my listeners like to hear is um, if you have any tips or tricks or ways that you keep all the flow, like always kind of Mm -hmm. moving forward. Yeah. I read an article. I can't even remember where it was many, many years ago, like 10 years ago now. And it was about how, you know, as creatives, we have to wear three different hats, um, not necessarily all at once at all times, but, you know, it's just to think about them as distinct kind of, um, quadrants of our brain. And one is, the artist, one is the editor, and one is the agent. And so I think once I read that article, I was like, oh my gosh, this is this is where I struggle when I try and switch hats too many times a day. Like I know that I am someone that really needs to protect and formulate my time so that I'm only wearing one hat at once. And Mm. there's, you know, of course, like when you're working on bigger projects, like a book, you know, you're maybe you're wearing your, your artist hat for a year (laughs) and you're wearing your editor hat for another year. And then you're wearing your agent hat when you have to promote it. Um, But when I'm not working on a bigger project and of 
course, like even while I am, I'm still doing the other things for my website and so keeping up with social media or whatnot. But I just have to be really careful. It's like, I think social media is the agent hat and it really gets in the way of getting other things done. And so mm-hmm. I have to make sure that I, I, um, oh my gosh, what's the word I'm looking for? Compartmentalize that work as much as possible so that I can protect um, some time where I can just wear the artist's hat um, uninhibited. Yeah, because I think artists probably does need the most protection and the most space to like yeah. really be who artist is. Otherwise, I think um, it's funny about social media, though. Um, if we go into it with the... Um, the way of like, you know, sharing value with our readers and with the people that we're here to help versus the consuming of information and taking it in. To me, I think the artist and the consumption is the part for that always is more of a clash uh, for for me, for me in particular. But you know what? Social media is such an interesting thing. I bet we could probably have a whole show talking Uh. about that because every every cookbook author has their own like little take about the value of it, the benefit of it, the drawbacks of it. Yeah. Um, But I love that you, the artist, the editor, and the agent. Do you, when you're not in cookbook mode, wear a different hat, like for a day or for a block of time? Yeah. 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 I mean, just with my website and even if we were to factor in like content creation for social media too, it's like, I like a day where I'm just ideating, brainstorming, maybe coming up with the recipe, then another day that's just for testing, then another day that's for editing, photos, video, input, like at writing the post itself, inputting it. Um, yeah, I kind of like to break up all these things. And then it's like, you know, kind of the end of the day is when I, um, you know, catch up on emails and do some yeah. of the like admin, social media, more agent hat, mindless scrolling yeah, <laughs> consumption. Yeah. yeah. You're at my, uh, your energy level good in the morning, afternoon. Evening? Yes. I, I get my most creative work done in the morning. So if yeah. I have any writing to do, I have to do it in the morning. Protect it for the morning. Um, yeah. yeah, exactly. And then the second half of the day, you know, when my energy is a little bit, um, more lagging, that's when I can kind of, I think editing is such a lovely task to do when your energy is lagging. Um, I just hate wearing the agent hat no matter what. So usually, <laughs> <least> favorite, yeah, <laughs> yeah, that part of the to-do list just gets kicked down the road indefinitely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now those are good tips. Great, great tips. And um, let's talk a little bit about um, other cookbooks. Now, one thing I like to ask my um, people coming on the show is we're wrapping up for discovery for other people about your favorite cookbooks, because um, I often find that people that write cookbooks love cookbooks and they have other cookbooks that they use. So do you have a favorite cookbook or two that you'd like to share with our audience? Yes. I mean, I think my favorites are always the most nostalgic. And so I have to go to the first cookbook that I ever purchased for myself, um, which was Jamie Oliver, The Naked Chef Takes Off. Um, And I was obviously just attracted to it because he was cute and young and there was naked in the title. Um, But I took it home and I was like, oh, like actually his like real chatty way of of recipe writing, um, which like didn't give a whole lot of, um, credence to measurements all the time. And he's just like, add like a handful of this and a glug of this and like a dap of that, like using, um, Britishisms for those things. I was like, oh, this is, it makes it actually really approachable and fun. And I was already someone who like, didn't love following recipes who just like to experiment. So, um, I really appreciated that. And yeah, I thought he made cooking seem like a cool, fun thing to do at home. Yeah. Not that I wasn't already doing it. Yeah. So Jamie Oliver, The Naked Chef Takes Off. We will link to that in the show notes as well as to uh, your book, Carbivore Plus. I'd like for you to tell everyone how they can connect with you online. Yes. I'm at Phoebe Lapine on social media and my website with lots of free recipes is feedmephoebe.com. And then you can, if you can't Google carbivore, you can just go to carbivorecookbook.com. And there are tons of links to purchase that. And there's also still a pre-order 
early bird special freebie that I have yet to take down. That's a two week blood sugar boot camp. So anyone who just enters the order receipt can get that. And it's just a, a fun two week email a day, um, program that helps you kind of take some of the baby steps that are offered in the book. Yeah. And you do talk a lot about uh, blood sugar. You talk a lot about there's a whole list of different terms that people maybe hear related to blood sugar. You kind of demystify those. So um, if you are carb curious, carb phobic, carb, you're a carb lover, this is the carb book for passionate. you. Carb passionate. Yeah. Carb passionate. I highly recommend <laughs> that you uh, pick up a copy of Carbivore, learn everything that Phoebe has to talk about, enjoy some of her delicious recipes. And um, a lot of really helpful information, a lot of resources that you have referenced. So um, it's sound and it's uh, a good resource for um, the carb passionate people in <laughs> your life or um, maybe for yourself as well. I can't thank you enough for coming on the show, sharing your new book with us and um, your journey as a cookbook writer, always of value and Uh, Thank you so much for everything that you're doing in the food space and for people with SIBO and Hashimoto's and the way that you're helping people really cook um, for themselves and feed themselves well. So thank you so much. Thank you, Maggie. Thank you so much for joining us today for this episode of the Cookbook Love Podcast. Again, all the links can be found in the show notes at www.cookbooklove.co. And if you are interested in writing a cookbook of your own, please check out the free cookbook writing masterclass called How to Get Paid to Write a Cookbook. It is designed specifically for food or nutrition experts, and you can check that out at www.cookbookwritersacademy.com slash free. So that's it for today's episode of the Cookbook Love Podcast. This is your host, Maggie Green, and until next time, have a great day and keep loving your cookbooks. Thanks for listening to the Cookbook Love Podcast. You can find out more information at www.cookbooklove.co.